The Pokemon franchise is finally on the Nintendo Switch and that is a very big deal. Not only does Nintendo's new handheld have a Pokemon, but this is the first time a Pokemon RPG has been available both on a handheld and on a console. Here is my review of Pokemon Let's Go for the Nintendo Switch. The main plotline of Let's Go is the same plotline we're already familiar with, just with a few twists and turns here. Because of the fact that this is a remake of Pokemon Yellow, the starter Pokemon are Pikachu and Eevee, plus you get several different scenes and scenarios where you run into Jesse and James instead of just the regular Team Rocket grunts. And that's all I can say to avoid spoilers, but there are a few little surprises when you get to the post-game. When it comes to gameplay, Let's Go is a turn-based RPG with tons of collecting elements thrown into the mix. Now first of all, let's talk about differences. These games are essentially remakes of Pokemon Yellow. The most obvious differences are the inspirations and connectivity they've made between Pokemon Go on mobile and Pokemon Let's Go on the Switch. All of the random encounters are now capture mini-games, similar to Go's version of the Safari Zone. Plus, we have the Go Park, where you can import Pokemon from Go into Let's Go, similar to how Pokemon Bank worked on the 3DS. Most of the other changes are just little quality of life things. The Pokemon box is available from the main menu instead of being locked to Pokemon centers. Pokemon can follow you around now and carry you around, and HMs are no longer battle moves. Now, outside of these changes, it feels just like a Kanto game, just in 3D, and a few things mixed up here and there with the gym leaders' rosters, giving you a bit of a mashup between their Gen 1 and Gen 2 rosters. But now let's talk about encounters and catching. Pokemon are no longer hidden from you when you're wandering around grassy areas. All of them are wandering around on the map with you. First of all, just let me state here that random encounters are still in this game. When you walk into an area, Pokemon start to spawn, and every area has different Pokemon that have a different percentage of spawning first. It's still random, so anybody who wants to do a Nuzlocke doesn't have to worry about having the same team every single time they attempt it. As I said earlier, when you actually do the encounters, it is a Safari Zone Pokemon Go-like catching game, where there's a Pokemon in front of you with a colored circle shrinking down around them. The goal is that when you throw a Pokeball, the smaller the circle is, the better your throw is, and the higher chance you have of catching them. Plus, you've got a bunch of berries that you can throw at the Pokemon to make them easier to catch and to make them stay still when they're constantly jumping around on the screen. Now, once you catch something, you get experience for your entire party. Kind of a balanced sort of thing, since wild encounters are no longer battles. The fact that you have to catch everything to get experience outside of trainer battles also means that there is a lot of balancing stuff thrown in here to help with that. Pokeballs, Great Balls, and all the other variations are significantly easier to buy now, Plus, you've got the ability to send all of your duplicate Pokemon to your professor and turn them into candies for stat increases so you don't have a box with the last 200 Pikachus you tried to catch because you really wanted a shiny. And that leads us into the big discussion on this game's difficulty. For months now, a lot of the more vocal members of the Pokemon community have been convinced that this is going to be a baby mode hand-holding game, and the difficulty really isn't like that. The first thing we have to go over here are the gym requirements. Every gym in the game has some condition that has to be met before you're allowed to challenge the gym. The first gym requires you to have a very specific type of Pokemon that's strong against the gym's type. Fortunately though, Brock is the only gym leader in the game with this type of requirement. The others either don't have a requirement at all, or require you to have so many Pokemon in your Pokedex, or at least one Pokemon of a certain level that's around the range of the gym leader's level. And these are balanced as well. Unless you are actively skipping trainer battles and encounters, I doubt anybody will have to go out of their way to gain the requirements for any of the gems outside of Brock in the case of a Nuzlocke. Now the battles and trainers themselves are just as difficult as they were back in the day. Brock is made a little bit easier because of your starters, but once you get to your third or fourth gym, a lot of the trainers and gym leaders are really going to make you have strategy and have good type coverage to be able to get through without a lot of trouble. And all of the special coach trainers that are set around the world are also very difficult, often rewarding you with new TMs when you beat them, but being a significant step up from everything else in the area. 
So the game's not really that easy, unless you abuse the candy system. Remember that when you transfer Pokemon over, you get candies that permanently increase your stats. And constantly catching the same Pokemon will give you special Pokemon candies that increases all of those Pokemon stats in one go. This can be abused to the point where stats don't matter for a Pokemon anymore. You can make a very frail, fragile Pokemon like Butterfree a Mewtwo killing monster by maxing out the candy system, giving him or her a good 200 extra points in all stats. Granted, it takes a long time to gather that much candy, but you can do it. Now let's dive into content and length. Despite Let's Go not including the Sevi Islands like Fire Red and Leaf Green did, you still have a pretty good amount of stuff to do in the post-game. Once you beat the Elite Four, you have a few extra post-game story missions you can do with your rival. You can re-challenge all of the gym leaders every day to fight them with new teams. You can infinitely re-challenge the Elite Four to fight them with new teams. And you've got all of the Master Trainers that you can fight, whom each have one member for every single Pokemon in the Pokedex, creating very difficult, tricky challenge missions where you have to fight them in a one-on-one -on -one match with the, just that Pokemon. Now when it comes to length, I know the Kanto region like the back of my hand, and I reached the Elite Four and beat them after playing for around 32 hours. For someone who's new to the series, it might take them 35 to 40 hours, but I would say 30 to 32 hours is probably a pretty good medium for previous players. Now let's dive into controls for a second. The catching game uses motion controls here. Throwing a ball with a Joy-Con is a matter of just flicking it up and down or flicking it to the left and right. And these controls are very inconsistent, specifically your side throws. When a Pokemon's in the middle of the screen, I've never had any problems just flicking the Joy-Con and getting a good throw. When they're to the left or right, I always have problems. I'll do the same gesture three or four times in, the, in a row, and every single time the Pokeball goes somewhere different on the screen. Granted, this is much easier to do in handheld mode where you just use gyro controls to aim at the Pokemon or the, or the throwing mechanics in the Pokeball Plus controller. But when you got Joy-Cons, it's very inconsistent. Now let's dive into presentation. Graphically, this game looks beautiful. When you've got it docked, there aren't any jagged edges, there's a ton of detail in all the shadows and all the environments, and all around, I am just amazed at how refined and polished this game looks, both in docked and in handheld mode. And performance is mostly the same. I never saw the frame rate drop outside of when I was navigating through menus. And the only other performance nitpick I have is that when you're doing double battles, there's a bit of a lag and delay when you input your commands for that turn and that turn actually starting. It doesn't happen in all double battles, but it happens in a fair amount of them. Now let's dive into our surprising battery life readings. I was expecting this gorgeous, beautiful game to have pretty not so great battery readings, but Pokemon Let's Go has a battery range of three hours and 16 minutes on high settings, up to four hours and 39 minutes on low settings. A bare minimum of over three hours out of a game that looks this pretty is very, very impressive. Now, in conclusion, Pokemon Let's Go is a beautiful and colorful remake that bridges a few different audiences together on the Switch. Now, some of the motion gestures in dock mode are not very consistent, and there's a bit of a delay when inputting commands in double battles. But all in all, this is a polished and very cute RPG with a lot to do and a lot to have fun with. Reviews to Go rates Pokemon Let's Go for the Nintendo Switch an 8.5 out of 10. If you have any comments or questions, feel free to leave them below or head to the website at reviewstogo.com. Hey there guys, thanks a bunch for watching the review. Before you go, my Patreon campaign is slowly climbing up. Head on over if you'd like to donate a little bit and help us get ads and monetization off of this channel. And if you're interested in Let's Plays and Long Plays, you can check out my new Long Play channel, where I'm currently doing a Nuzlocke run of this very game, Pokemon Let's Go. Both links are in the description. Thanks again for watching, have a good day.